no question in my mind, having um, uh, performed and, and studied Thomas Jefferson now for a good 25 years, that uh, yes, perhaps, and I don't want to make it seem as if he should receive the, the pity award for, for this by any means, because he was a man who would never resort or never uh, cater to pity, but he probably uh, realized more personal loss in his life than, than any other president. He lost five of his six children uh, by the time he was standing for re-election in, in 1804. And, uh, of course, his uh, wife died after only 10 years of marriage. He, he knew that her health was very frail, particularly in childbirth. Uh, he lost his mother just as he was preparing to go up to Philadelphia for the extension of the Second Continental Congress. Uh, that was in late March uh, 1776. So all of the great influences in his life, his personal influences, uh, were taken from him at a young age, and I forgot to mention his father who died when Thomas Jefferson was only 14 years of age. Uh, this cannot help but produce some sense of melancholy in an individual, and I think Jefferson suffered from that when he was young. Uh, I think he came to know how to deal with it. I, it there's every indication that he, he learned how to deal with it and how he overcame it. I think he overcame it, and I, I don't think entirely it was, all, it was always something that was a part of him. But I find Jefferson and Lincoln very similar in those respects. Uh, they were two individuals who were dedicated to the preservation of not only the natural rights of the individual, but particularly the, the happiness and the security of the individual. And uh, I think that brought over from that intimate personal sense into the national scene uh, bode well for their ability to attend to administrating public office, understanding the, uh, the, the nature of the individual, human nature, and having a great compassion for mankind. Jefferson was a great advocate of, of personal control, controlling your passions. And um, we, we know that, that Mr. Jefferson at times did lose his temper, uh, but they weren't to the detriment of another individual right there on the scene. They, many eyewitnesses say he had the most perfect manners of anyone they ever knew. Uh, but he was a redhead, so in the <laughs> evidence, he, he, he had a fiery temperament. That, uh, but he did work to control that. There was a great belief at that time that part of the, a gentleman's criteria for being recognized as a gentleman was to control your, your passions and to maintain your uh, chivalric manners, uh, a, a sense of decorum and containing uh, yourself. Uh, here in the play, Howard Ginsburg's play, we have Mr. Jen Jefferson ranting and raving about blood and and fire of revolution. Well, Mr. Jefferson simply said, as we know, a revolution is a good thing every generation or so. The tree of liberty needs to be continually refreshed with the blood of patriots as well as of tyrants. And that's not even his original opinion. It's, it's Montesquieu and, and many others throughout human history who have advocated when there comes a time that human rights are being imposed upon and being denied, it is a natural right of the people to rise up in order to reclaim them. We think of Jefferson as usurping all of this authority in, in his office as president, for say, for the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, he, he did not. He, the whole Louisiana Treaty was, was uh, moved along and negotiated by Robert R. Livingston, uh, who was our Minister Plenipotentiary to France. When it arrived in the United States for ratification, it did not go to the desk of the President, it went to the Congress. And where Congress could not agree on it and, and ratify it, well, then yes, Jefferson used his authority as President to move and push the Congress to ratify one way or another. He was very fair saying, if, you, if you're not in favor for this, we'll vote on it and let Bonaparte have his answer. Uh, also, Jefferson said, I am not an advocate for frequent changes in laws and, uh, and in the Constitution, but whenever 
we may come to a, a stalemate, and now I'm sort of uh, going out with the precise words he used, but whenever we may come to a, a question in our laws, a question in our Constitution, or to a stalemate, I am for the progressive uh, amelioration of the difficulties and getting rid of old laws and instituting new laws. He said an individual or a nation even has the right to go above the law in the preservation of their life in the preservation of the safety and defense of the nation. So I think this is all something we would naturally take as a, uh, uh, um, a modus operandi that we would follow uh, rather than be too ready to, to revolt, too ready to rebel. Let's, let's work it out. Remember, the, 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 the colonies did not immediately rebel. The colonies, it was over a, a period of time that they tried to uh, receive redress for their grievances. They went all through the formalities uh, uh, to receive redress. It was when they were denied the redress for their grievances that they finally came together, bound, bound together. And look, the Declaration of Independence is even a civil effort to pronounce to the rest of the world what these colonies were now doing in forming a new nation because they'd been ignored in their, their efforts to achieve redress for grievance. I, I think what brought uh, Jefferson and Adams together was something that was recognized in the First Continental Congress, to which Jefferson was, was elected and should have been there. He fell ill. He could not go up to Philadelphia in September 1774. Adams was there, so Adams was able to hear Patrick Henry, Jefferson's collaborator and friend, uh, pronounced to the entire Congress that he was no longer a Virginian, he was an American. And, and I think at that very beginning, uh, there was a recognition that no matter whether you were from Georgia or from Connecticut or Massachusetts or in between, that there was a cohesion, there was, a, there was something American that was a very like experience uh, throughout all of these individual colonies. They were very different, as people are different, but they did have something in common, and that was the American experience of several generations living in North America, very different from the experience of their ancestors who either came from Great Britain or other European kingdoms and monarchies. That, as Jefferson said, we had already come to taste the sweetness of liberty, which means they had come to understand what liberty and freedom was all about, particularly younger sons who were flocking to, to North America because they could make a livelihood for themselves. They were not subject to laws of primogeniture and entail. In instances, yes, I mean, oh, these old habits and customs did continue the reign in Virginia, but if you were a younger son, you could come to Virginia, acquire land, and there you are. You're, you're the master of your own destiny, and you have an elder son who may receive that property, but at least you have the advantage uh, yourself as a younger son initially. So this was all coming together as a common recognition. They were all beginning to realize that what guarantees them in this liberty and freedom were not only British rights, but what Locke, Newton, Bacon, Montesquieu, Montaigne were all purporting to be human rights, the natural rights uh, of mankind. So I think that's what they were recognizing, whether they from, were from the North or the South.